Good evening. I'm Tan Sui Che, the President of the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the IFOA's 2020 Autumn Lecture. This is the first time that the event has been conducted virtually, but I would like to extend a warm welcome to you all, wherever you are, as if you are meeting in the Staple Inn this evening. At the last count, there were over 800 people tuning into tonight's live stream. One of the great things about the new virtual world is that it can connect us globally. I happen to be joining you from Singapore at about midnight tonight. The IFOA hosts two lectures every year to discuss topical policy areas that are not only important to actuaries, but to policymakers and the public. We host these lectures twice a year to showcase how the work of actuaries relates to the wider world and our commitment to leading debates in the public interest. This is an important part of fulfilling the obligations set out in our Royal Charter. This evening, we are delighted to be joined by Professor Alroy Dimson. Alroy is the Professor of Finance and Research Director at Cambridge Judge Business School. He is co-founder and chairman of Cambridge University Centre for Endowment Asset Management and a bi-fellow of Gonville and Chaos College, Cambridge. I'm sure that many of our audience are familiar with Alroy's work. I especially enjoy reading his book, The Triumph of the Optimist, 101 Years of Global, Global Investment Returns, some 20 years ago, which analyzed investment returns for equities, bonds, bills, currencies across 16 countries from the end of the 19th century to the beginning of the 21st. We are honored tonight He will be sharing with us some of his latest research with the actuarial community. Alroy's research focuses on long-term asset management and responsible investing. And his recent publications are on active ownership, investment management, endowment strategy, ESG investing, and financial history. He chairs the advisory and policy boards of FTSE Russell, and until 2016, he chaired the Strategy Council of Norway's Sovereign Wealth Fund. Elroy has been an honorary fellow of the Institute since 2002. I would like to thank Professor Dinson for taking time out of his busy schedule to join us tonight. In keeping with the global theme, I'm looking forward to hearing his lecture which has a focus on the US and the long-term investment of university endowments. After the lecture, there'll be a Q&A session. You can, you can submit a question at any time via the online Q&A function on Zoom, and I would encourage you all to do so. This session is also being recorded and will be, av and will be available to view on our website afterwards. So if you plan to take part in the Q&A session later, please bear in mind to include your name and also to tell us where you are from. Although there is an option to do this anonymously should you wish to do so. On this note, it is my pleasure to hand over to Professor Dimson. Well, good day, everyone, and uh, thank you, CJ, for your very kind words and introduction. Uh, it's a particular pleasure, of course, to be talking to such a large group of actors, um, and this is perhaps the biggest honour that I've received uh, since nearly two decades ago you were elected me as an honorary fellow of uh, the uh, Institute. So, uh, I was invited to talk about uh, whatever takes my fancy, really. Uh, it was a, a very kind and uh, broad uh, opportunity. 
And I thought that it would be most interesting for me to speak about some of the issues that I've been researching uh, with two colleagues uh, over uh, recent times. We have uh, written this up in a paper that I'll tell you about in my last slide of this presentation, which is called 75 Years of Investing for Future Generations. And it's uh, joined with two colleagues at Cambridge Judge Business School, uh, David Chambers and Carrie Claire Caffey. Uh, and uh, what uh, I'll do is to take you through some of the uh, insights that we've uh, developed based on some extensive and very long-term data. So this is a paper that hasn't been shared before, and uh, this is the first time that it's uh, been publicly shared with, uh, with anyone. Uh, even my presentation to uh, our university departments is not yet uh, happening. It's a few days away. So uh, without any further ado, let me uh, take you through to um, the, the uh, next uh, uh, slide that uh, it would be that will make sense for me to share with you. So let me just uh, have a quick look at why my sharing is not moving forward. Um, we'll do it the longhand way. So what I'd like to do is to explain the title that we've used for this session and for this paper and preview our research and then afterwards I'll tell you a bit about the endowment model that we're investigating and I'll tell you a bit about the long-term data set which has a US focus because that's where uh, the largest university endowments are based and then I'll look at some key questions who are the strategy leaders in terms of endowment asset management and uh, do endowments do what we think they ought to do, which is to behave like long-term uh, investors? Why 75 years? Well, I was actually asked to do this research along with my co-authors to celebrate 75 years of another professional association. It's a professional gathering that is not uh, as long established as uh, actuaries are. It goes back 75 years. And uh, uh, the uh, Financial Analyst Journal, which is, uh, as it were, the house magazine of the uh, Chartered Financial Analyst Institute, is celebrating 75 years of the existence of the journal. And this was an opportunity to look back, and I was given a free hand, to look back both at how the academic investment and finance community has developed, and also to look at what implications that has had for long-term investment, which is an area of particular interest. So the, the Financial Analyst Journal was launched in 1945. Here it is. In 1945, it came out as the Analyst Journal, which originated for the New York Society of Security Analysts, uh, but it rapidly evolved into being called the Financial Analyst Journal and having a, a, a broader focus. At first, it focused on fundamental analysis of various sorts, uh, and then it evolved to embrace investment theory, investment practice, uh, and looked uh, a little bit uh, more like a post-war journal than something done on uh, economy paper. But it's not just 75 years of the CFA Institute and French Analyst Journal, 75 years especially in other ways. Uh, economists, prior to 1945, rarely spent much time on thinking about finance. Uh, that was a, a side issue, in a sense, for economists. But in 1945, the journal of finance was initiated. It took a while to set it up. The first issue didn't actually appear until 1946, summer of 1946. And so at first, the journal of finance, this is the picture of uh, volume one, number one, focused on banking and the economy, and it then evolved to address corporate finance and asset pricing, the things which uh, many of us discuss, apply, and, and research. So that's a little bit on the academic background, and I'll revert to that. But at the same time, 
uh, there was an evolution in terms of the way long-term assets are managed. Uh, and this had been the uh, prerogative in the United Kingdom of, um, uh, of actuaries. But so gradually, uh, there was a, a migration there in terms of uh, how assets would be managed. And I'm taking a US perspective in this. That's where the big players are, as you'll see. Um, immediately after the war, Harvard University uh, discussed a lot of pressing issues um, and they pledged to reform admissions and to admit women to what had previously been a men's college. So 1945 was a break point with the past and uh, the university moved forward in a relatively rapid way. And so by 1948, they had a new treasurer for the university and unusually a chief investment officer. Uh, he was the chief executive officer of State Street. Um, he was an alumnus. Uh, his name was Paul Cabot, a very distinguished uh, family in the life of the Boston community. Uh, this is a picture of a recently published biography of uh, Paul Cabot, and it's the first such, uh, such document about uh, the life of a pioneer for investment. Uh, for those of you who um, think that uh, men can only single task, um, I think that's probably true, but uh, he was a dual tasker. He remained CEO of State Street, a premier investment institution, and he was CIO and treasurer of the university, uh, all packed into a very busy life. But the distinguishing feature of this uh, late 1940s initiative was that it was the first time that an outside investment professional ran the endowment. So that is, I think, uh, another break point. So there are two things that were happening. One was professional and academic on the one hand, and the other was uh, the beginnings of uh, professionalizing the uh, investment of long-term pools of funds. So let me take you forward a little bit and explain a bit more about uh, what I'm discussing. I'm sure there's people with a wide variety of backgrounds here. So endowments are funds that aim to meet the needs of beneficiaries over multiple generations. Uh, I'm on the investment committee of uh, my Cambridge college. Um, and uh, the focus of our discussions and our investment is always to maintain some degree of intergenerational equity. We want to look after the students who are with us, and we want to be able to look after future generations of students. So people sometimes ask the question, well, your college, my college is Gonville and Keys, um, what, what's your time frame? What's your time horizon? What's the uh, period that you're investing for? And I and others basically say, we don't know. We've been going for 700 plus years. It would be an awfully, awful pity if the endowment ran out of funds in the next 700 years. So we're thinking a long way ahead. Um, so intergenerational equity, uh, ensuring that there are funds for the future as well as for the present time is important. And that's a challenge. It may be something which uh, those of you who ask questions come back, take me back to. So what do people do? There's been an evolving literature since around about 1945. There have been major US endowments that we look at from 1945, but we extend the evidence back all the way to 1900, so that in all, we're able to look at a 120 year experience of managing endowments. So we, we, here, here's what I have to share with you. Uh, so let's suppose you um, have a child sitting beside you while you're trying to look at your laptop. Uh, and you want to break, hang on for this slide and I'll tell you what I'm going to tell everybody else. Uh, we study endowments from 1945 as well as earlier periods. We look at 12 major universities uh, and we focus on their preferences for risky assets. We document their strategic moves. Those were moves from fixed income into equities and later from uh, equities uh, to alternative assets. And we analyze how they invested around the times of financial crisis. And here's the conclusion for those of you who have to tend to an insistent child. On average, these funds invested counter-cyclically. 
They increased their allocation to risky assets after a crisis. Uh, they were moving in the opposite direction to the herd. Now that might, might sound like a sensible strategy, but mostly what we find is that people tend to move with the herd, move with the flow in markets. Uh, and there ought to be a category of investors who are going in the other direction. So when some are buying, others are selling and vice versa. Um, this is the, the group that we think typify those counter cyclical investors. So we're looking here at endowments. These are pools of funds for future generations. And I'd like to tell you a little bit more about that to set the scene a little bit for you. There is a lot of literature. Um, there are a set of professional studies, and I've highlighted the ones which are in the journal that's published in this paper. Um, studies which go back in some cases to the 1940s, where our breakpoints at 75 years begins, uh, looking at uh, the dangers of pro cyclical investing, that is, when shares go up, buying more of them. Uh, and uh, when they go down, getting out for fear of losing money. So this is a preoccupation that people have in the endowment management world, uh, but it's not new. It's been going for uh, a lifetime or two. Um, there's a literature which documents the shifts towards equities, which in the early days were thought to be as unsuitable for long-term endowments in the US as they were deemed to be unsuitable for similar endowments uh, in other countries such as the United Kingdom. We look at a debate which was uh, uh, a focus of professional money managers and uh, trustees as early as the 1960s. By 1971, there was a, a, a quite insightful paper on the choice between internal asset management and outsourced asset management. Over that decade, there was the emergence of uh, a, a series of textbooks which focused on evidence-based investing. And the first one of those was a book by Laurie and Hamilton, excerpts of which were published in the early 1970s. And then Fisher Black, the origination of the Black-Scholes model, weighed in in the middle of the 1970s, describing how endowments should invest in a way which is consistent with what the rest of the university does, in just the same way as Fisher Black had argued that companies should think of their pension fund as part of an overall financial plan that sits alongside the financial planning and financial strategy of the corporation. As we move forward, we move into an era where there was more thought about dynamic strategies, not simply what should the policy be, but how should it change over time. And Phil Didrig and uh, Nobel laureate uh, Bill Sharp, along with Andre Perold from then at Harvard Business School, wrote on how strategies should evolve over time. And the strategy from their point of view was a strategy which also tells you what to do when markets move. Recently, over the last few months, there have been surveys by Stephen Brown uh, from uh, Australia, most of the time, New York, some of the time, uh, by Will Getzman from Yale, uh, contributing separate articles on the historical evolution of investment management in its various forms. And finally, I'll give a, a minor plug for my own work, which started with Triumph of the Optimists, and we produce an annual book co-authored with my two London Business School colleagues, Paul Marsh and Mike Staunton monitoring long-term returns from different asset classes for what is now 23 countries that we uh, monitor uh, in an annual book, which is updated regularly and looks not only at returns, but at factor returns and a wide variety of other issues. There's also an academic stream of literature. We talk about intergenerational equity um, and the uh, uh, person who founded that uh, phrase, that term, was James Tobin, another Nobel laureate writing in the American Economic Review. Uh, we focus on endowment assets allocation. Uh, this, this is Keith Brown, different from the Stephen Brown I was mentioning earlier. We look at the factors that are uh, geared towards the success of endowments. We look at the innovation of endowments that have to do work with my colleague 
uh, David Chambers. Uh, we look at uh, periods of crisis, uh, papers in Journal Portfolio Management, an American Economic Review that address that. How you should rebalance over time, a very hot issue for anyone that's involved with uh, these sorts of topics. Um, whether investors tend to herd, whether they tend to follow each other, uh, and whether they tend to be cyclical, anti-cyclical or pro-cyclical in their investment strategy. These are the large literatures and the link that I'll give you to the uh, paper is uh, a link where all of these references are listed uh, at the back of the paper. But the endowment model came into uh, the, the limelight, I think, with David Swenson's appointment as the Chief Investment Officer of Yale University. Uh, he was uh, hired as a, a Yale PhD who had gone to work on Wall Street and he came as a 31 year old with uh, a very large uh, fund to look after. And he gradually formulated his views. Uh, I wrote a book called uh, Endowment Asset Management with uh, a colleague Shanta Acharya. Um, and we visited all 61 Oxford and Cambridge colleges where we met with the Bursa uh, and we discussed their, their approaches. And I noted which book was most frequently on their shelves. And there's only one book that was on the majority of the shelves that I saw when we visited the uh, Bursa or CIO of these uh, 60 plus Oxbridge colleges. And that was this one by David Swenson. And when people refer to what sometimes the Swenson model, sometimes the endowment model, sometimes the Yale model, what they're referring to are the features that, that uh, David Swenson uh, focused on. He focused on investing for the long term through uh, not buying riskless securities, which had been in the way of the first half of the 20th century, but focusing on equity-like returns. He focused on the importance of diversification and the fact that if you can diversify across different assets, you can afford to take assets which otherwise would seem rather more risky. Um, uh, he focused on the notion that public asset markets are efficient, which produced a bias towards private assets and non-traditional assets. He focused on the importance of finding managers through a very careful, diligent, detailed form of selection. He focused on uh, the alignment of incentives between the asset manager and the asset owner, uh, and all the way through, uh, building on academic foundations to guide asset management. So let's go back to when he was first appointed, which was on this graph on the left-hand side, 1986. And this graph runs through to 2020. When he came to Yale, if you look on the left hand side, you'll see the dominant asset was domestic equity, dark blue. That were represented somewhere between a half and uh, two thirds of uh, all of the assets that were in Yale's endowments. And then stacked on top of that were a small, small amount of uh, foreign equities and then fixed income, primarily local, and then some real assets. About 80% uh, of all of the assets in that fund were American about 80% were listed equities and bonds. And if you look at what happened over time, uh, it's, it's quite astonishing. Domestic equities, which had been very important, shrank to just 2.7% by value of the endowment. Foreign equities came to be more important. Hedge fund strategies came to be very much more important. Private equity, private assets, uh, which are towards the right, the red area is divided into two parts, got to be important. Uh, and real estate expanded and then contracted somewhat. So this was somebody who brought new ideas forward. And this inspired us to ask the question, are there leaders and are there followers in the endowment asset management world? So our data was one where we uh, look at the Ivy League uh, universities. The Ivy League is, for those of you not uh, based in the US, a majority of you. Uh, it's an athletic league, really, of eight universities in the Northeast United States. Um, and so uh, the Ivy League is sometimes uh, used to refer not to this uh, athletic league table, but to an elite group of colleges 
Uh, and if we look back to the old uh, universities, um, it really is rather interesting in terms of the number of them. Um, I'm from the United Kingdom, um, but I was brought up in England. England has only two ancient universities, Oxford and Cambridge. Scotland did a little bit better. Uh, so we have just two uh, in England, um, and all the others came into existence in the 1800s or 1900s, or possibly one or two more recently. So most of the uh, ancient universities uh, in the sort of Anglo-Saxon world are in England, but they're in New England. <laughs> they're not in the England that I'm living in. And of those nine pre-American Revolution, American Civil War universities, seven of them are Ivy League. Two of them elected to become public universities instead. They're really important. In this year, uh, the US news ranking of universities had all eight of the Ivies in their top 20. They're wealthy. Uh, the most impoverished is Brown University with $5 billion and Harvard uh, is the most wealthy with $42 billion in the endowment. Uh, and for those of you who are dialing in from other places, uh, the comparisons might be with the C9 League in China, the Imperial Universities in Japan. There are other elite groups. So these are the ones that we're mostly looking at. Um, and they compete not only in sport. I could show you tables of their sporting accomplishments, but they compete in terms of uh, endowment performance as well. So in this checkerboard, you can see that uh, there are sometimes universities that are doing poorly and sometimes they, they, they do well. So on the left hand side in 2010, Yale uh, was suffering. It still had a favorable return, uh, but it was at the bottom of the league. But as you follow your way across, you'll see that the uh, light lilac color by 2011 was in the upper half where it was in 2012, in 2013, in 2014, 2015. Uh, and you can, see, you can see they have varying fortunes, but you're not always at the top and you're not always at the bottom. Uh, these tables give you some indication as to how their assets are moving in value. It shows you where some of the disasters are. Uh, but of course, some of these are private assets and uh, the valuation of private assets means that sometimes you'll be left behind as a university one year and you'll catch up the next year. But these numbers are watched and watched carefully. We look at all the Ivy League and for non-Ivy. So sometimes there's a, a, a reference to Ivy Plus, which is a slightly larger group. Um, the plus is a little bit uh, uh, unclear. So the ones we look at are the eight Ivy League, Brown University, Columbia, Cornell, Dartmouth, Harvard, Princeton, uh, University of Pennsylvania and Yale. And then we take four uh, non-Ivy League endowments, uh, University of Chicago, Johns Hopkins, MIT, and Stanford. And we take those because they were ranked very highly in a survey in the 1920s. And our desire is not to use hindsight in terms of which ones were the, became large. We're interested in uh, identifying the group that would have been thought of as the prestige group back in 1900. Now we want to look at evidence without using any hindsight on this. And so this is the uh, explanation for uh, wanting to go a long way back. Um, here's a, a, a spoof journal done in the style that was followed by the journal Portfolio Management that uh, used to be published by uh, Institution Investor Journals. So this is a spoof that uh, is uh, put on Twitter anonymously, but I thought it was really funny. So. Um, uh, here they have a set of articles, so in August, uh, th their feature on endowment performance had the subtitle, What You Should Have Done Ten Years Ago. And uh, that was uh, the, the, the title, not the subtitle, uh, was actually was uh, an article from uh, Richard Ennis, actually uh, a very prominent person in the investment business. Um, and then if we look to early September 2020, uh, they had an, um, uh, more, they're just front covers. The, the, the man who, or woman who has done this found uh, uh, on, a, uh, on a website firm that was 
uh, put, uh, put together these spoof uh, uh, front pages. So I particularly like this one that's near the bottom uh, from our archive. It says, Fact and Fantasies about Commodity Futures. That is the title of uh, uh, a paper by uh, Gary Gorton and Dirk Roenhorst, which was very influential. It's persuaded people that commodities uh, would be the perfect place to go. So the subtitle that this person has given so this was commodities were an ideal diversifier for stocks and bonds between 1959 and 2004. And since then, actually, they haven't been so great. And one more example, uh, which uh, was from late September 2020, uh, the career corner. Uh, CIO compensation, Chief Investment Officer compensation and, and one year returns. And then the person who's done this has uh, given the subtitle, finding more spurious correlations than a retired consultant's research. Uh, and Charles Carina is the, the premier person that uh, heads up uh, an organization that headhunts people in our industry. So you can see what, what, is be, be, what is going on here is the accusation that people look back only a short period and too often form a view as to um, what you should be doing based on the internet evidence. Our data set is a long-term one, and that's what I'm going to take you through uh, now. So we have these 12 top university endowments from 1900 to 2017. We look at the asset allocation, so we've collected this data, and we have, we have estimates of their returns annually. The data is largely hand-collected, although uh, more recently, one can simply down this, download this from NACUBA, the National Association of College and University Business Offices. And then we have asset class returns from my own work. And the key research questions that we want to confront these uh, data with is twofold. Do endowments herd when they create long-term strategy? So this is not the short-term herding, where people sell out of a mutual fund this month and others decide that that's bad news and next month are, are moving out. We're looking at the long-term strategy and are they counter-cyclical? So I'm going to show you some of the results. To avoid flickering the screen in front of you, uh, I'd ask you just to ignore the bits in yellow and imagine that they are co colored in a way which is consistent with the rest of the chart. So on the left-hand column, you can see the universities the Ivy League and beneath them the non-Ivies, and then you can see the averages for Ivy and non-Ivy and for all universities. Um, and we show their assets under management in 1900, our data for the Ivies goes all the way back to 1900. The non-Ivies include a couple that are newer in terms of their endowment history. <coughs> Excuse me. And so uh, we've got uh, their, their uh, AUM, which is somewhat larger for um, Johns Hopkins University and for Stanford. And then you can see what they, they are today. And in the right hand column, you can see what their assets have grown by. So this growth comes about from uh, appreciation and reinvested income minus disbursements plus gifts that they receive. So I've highlighted in yellow bits that I found interesting. One is that with the exception of Cornell, uh, all of this, I, these Ivy League uh, group are from the 1600s and 1700s. And on the right hand side, I'm showing you how they've grown. And they've grown in real terms by about 4% per year, a bit more for the Ivies, who have been successful perhaps at bringing in more money, uh, and a bit less for the non Ivies, but about 4% real. And since I'm talking to actuaries, you know that compound interests. Well, it doesn't make much difference over a couple of years, but if you do it over uh, periods like a century, it uh, makes a big difference. Uh, and so now I'm picking out some tables from our results. Uh, here we're looking at these uh, different endowments from their inception up to 2017. And so what I'm choosing to look at, we've got an inception date there, mostly they start uh, for our series, uh, in 1900, but sometimes a little bit after because we don't have quite the full data that we want, although we do know the value of the uh, Ivy League funds in 1900. So we've got their annualized returns uh, and we've got their arithmetic mean returns, the standard deviation, the sharp ratio. And what I'll do is highlight bits in yellow now for all the universities 
the annualized return was 5.6% compound. And is that good or bad? Well, over the period from 1900, going back to the data which I compile with Paul Marsh and Mike Staunton, that's much closer to what equities gave you, US equities, uh, and quite a long way away from what you would have got from the bonds that they held, government bonds and corporate bonds. I want to repeat this table now with a common start date, because these have a similar start date, but not all of them begin in 1900. Uh, and we can do that here. Uh, and so here you can see that from 1950 to 2017, this is what you might call, at least at my age, you might call the modern era. Um, you can see universities from 1950 to 2017 uh, produced a, an annualized return of 6.6%. Uh, equities gave us only a little bit more and uh, bonds considerably less. So uh, I can't give you a, a, a benchmark that's appropriate for each university individually. They have different asset mix strategies. That's something we'll look at shortly. But uh, you can see that they have done quite well. So let's have a look at the leaders and the followers in this, uh, uh, in this game. Um, what, was, what did their asset mix look like? Here we go from 1900 through to 2017. Uh, the green line on the left hand side shows that on average they started out with three quarters of uh, the endowment wealth invested in fixed income. The highest allocation was almost 100%. The lowest uh, was about 50%. And those dotted lines, either side of the green line, uh, the, they, it is in each year the highest. So it's not necessarily uh, the same university from one year to the next, which is the highest. And on the right, you can see equities. On average, equities were well under one tenth of endowment assets, although there was one that rapidly moved to holding more. Uh, equities rose to a peak um, around about the 70s, and around about the 80s or 90s started to drift down. Uh, uh, there, were, uh, there were universities that had a very low allocation to equity, so you can see the line at the bottom is uh, really flat for uh, at least one of these endowments that clung on to the old model of investing in a safe way and not uh, investing in what were deemed to be risky securities. And the other two asset classes that we look at are real estate and alternatives. So here you can see real estate, the average was below 20%, never rose above that. One university had a much higher allocation. Uh, it, in principle, could be a different university each year, but it wasn't. Uh, the blue dotted line all the way through represents Columbia. Columbia owned a large slice of real estate in uh, Manhattan. It's uh, the, the New York wealth of uh, uh, Columbia University uh, is the high one. And that pulls the average up quite a long way. And you see the lowest of uh, 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 those who have virtually no uh, allocation to a real estate. And then on the right, you can see alternative assets. Uh, and those only became important after 1980. But as you go through, you can see that uh, early in the 2000s, uh, there was a move towards, on average, holding a good 50% of endowment wealth in alternatives. And even though we moved past the, set, the, the setback of 2000-2001, uh, uh, where you can see no impact, uh, the setbacks of 2008, the, uh, the, uh, the, the setbacks in, in uh, market values, uh, once you move into the global crisis, what is striking there to me is that having moved up with alternative assets, uh, those did not stay in there uh, of, on a transitory basis. Uh, they actually have remained at a high level. And so the average allocation to alts remains around about the 50% mark, despite the fact that uh, people are not convinced any longer that there's going to be alpha that is produced by the uh, alternative assets or other uh, sources of superior performance. So there were two major changes of strategy. First, pre-World War II endowments held the majority of their assets in fixed income. 
But by the 1930s, the allocation to equities is already beginning to rise and it reached something like 60% in the 60s, 70s, 80s. Strategy change number two, uh, alternative assets were introduced into, into, into endowments in the 1980s. The average weighting is close to 50% and that strategic change, as I've remarked, has survived despite the challenges of the global financial crisis, despite the challenges of illiquidity, it really made life very difficult for endowments uh, in the early stages after the global crisis uh, uh, came about. Uh, and uh, considerable doubts in people's minds as to whether the alpha generating capability, which was believed to be there in the 1990s, still exists in the 2010s, 2020s. So here we can look at the equity allocation of IV leave compared to non-IV leave endowments. Uh, so you can see we're going through decade by decade. We're looking at the IV leave allocation, which uh, started as a low allocation to equities. The non-IV leave in the next column, a little bit lower, uh, and then moved up. You can see the difference between the two. Uh, I'll come back to that. Uh, you can see the p-values, uh, and those p-values indicate, in general, that this is not uh, a chance event from random outcomes. And on the right-hand side, you can see the average uh, since NACUBO, the National Association of uh, College and University Business Office, Offices, started monitoring this and so you can see the average of uh, one half of endowment assets being invested uh, in equities. So in that common label difference you can see that Ivy League had much more in equities in 1910s, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, 60s. And in the 70s uh, it became more neutral in the 1980s with roughly par parity and then by the 1990s and 2000s um, the Ivy League started cutting back on their equity allocation. So you can see those negative numbers uh, marked in, uh, in yellow, of minus 8.6 and minus 4.8. Uh, and so they moved out. And we'll have a look at where they went next. So to sum up what we've seen so far, um, larger endowments tended to switch strategy earlier. Smaller endowments tended to follow the leaders, and the big three, that's Harvard, Princeton, and Yale, were the first movers, as we'll see a little bit more of. So what about the, the uh, allocation to alternative assets? But here you see a similar table. Uh, there was no uh, noticeable allocation to alternatives up to the 1970s. But here you can see within the 1980s, alternatives, uh, were unimportant for the Ivy League. Actually, the non-Ivy uh, had slightly uh, more in alternatives. But by the time you move into the 1990s, you can see the Ivy League putting much more in than the non-Ivies, um, and you can see that gap was maintained. And so you can see highlighted in yellow the difference between the two, um, and a p-value, which uh, is suggestive of something real that's going on. So that's the old allocation to alternatives. Let's blend in a little bit more, because the big three were important in all of this: Harvard, uh, Yale, and Princeton. And so here you can see the big three allocation. Uh, in, in, in looking in panel B, the lower half of this uh, chart, you can see a rising proportion allocated by the big three. And then we look at the other Ivies, who still have a big allocation to alternatives but not as big. And then you can see the difference between the big three and the other IVs. So there are eight IVs altogether. It's the big three versus the uh, less big five. Uh, and you can see uh, a difference which is quite marked, that there's a significant uh, difference between the allocation to alternatives um, between those groups. So Harvard, Princeton, and Yale uh, led the trend. So I want to allocate my closing minutes uh, to looking at how endowments move. And you've already seen some indication that there were leaders and followers. Um, and now I want to see whether they tend to herd or move counter cyclically, looking at them as a group. And so to do that, we're looking at uh, 
cases where there was a major stock market crisis. Um, there are a number of sources of what are deemed to be uh, major panics. Um, the six that I use are the ones that are common to most of these rankings. Uh, the panic of uh, 1907, when if you look at uh, Bob Schiller's website, you see stocks in the US falling by 38%. The Wall Street crash, much more dramatic. The economic recession of 1937. The uh, stock market crash of 74. Uh, and then the end of the dot-com bubble, where there was a similar sort of drop, uh, and the global financial crisis, the onset of that, where uh, America had the value of common stocks halving. And so what I've got to look at with you is year-by-year uh, -year data, because we have only annual data, um, and the reporting period for endowments in the United States, as in many countries, uh, runs along the lines of fiscal years, financial years. And so for all these endowments, the reporting year is from the end of June to the end of the following June. So the crisis years are in June 1907, June 1930, and so forth. And what we look at is the run-up to that period and what happens afterwards. So just to explain myself a little bit more, endowments could be counter-cyclical, they could be pro-cyclical or there could be no clear pattern at all. What I mean by counter-cyclical is that they tend to sell the risky asset before the onset of a crisis. So they tend to sell the risky asset as it becomes more expensive and they can then uh, sell at an inflated price. And then they'll buy back once the risky asset is cheap. A pro-cyclical investor buys the risky asset before the onset of the crisis, so as stock prices are going up, for example, the pro-cyclical investor buys more of it, going along with the crowd, and then sells afterwards when markets are collapsing. And the way we do this is there is a, a procedure which has been used in a number of published studies. Uh, I mentioned them at the beginning, but they're, they're, they're referenced in the paper. We split the asset mix change into two components. One is the passive component that simply reflects movements in a comprehensive index for each uh, asset class. Uh, what would have happened, in other words, if you didn't buy or sell any securities, but you just simply went with the flow and the active components, where that is the change in uh, asset exposure that is not attributable to market fluctuations. And we look at, then at the active change in the equity allocation pre and post crisis, and then we report those active changes around the six crisis periods. We would like to do more, but there are only six of those crisis periods. So we have six and 12 universities. So this is a limited sample, um, but we're looking here at strategic changes where our unit of measurement is not days or months, but uh, uh, years at a time. So this is the final table that I'll look at, and then I'll make some concluding remarks. Uh, and I want you to, uh, I want first of all to explain this. We've got three panels. Each panel shows the average active change, so strip out the impact of uh, market fluctuations, the average for all six um, uh, university endowments. And we break that down into the average for the IVIS and the average for the non IVIS. And then we break it down in panel B into looking at the 20th century crises only and the 21st century crises only. I want to look mostly at the top panel, panel A. And so what you see here um, is uh, the run-up to year T, financial year T, which is the year of the crisis. And now I'm going to look at the right-hand side. So in year T plus one, there was an active change, and that is uh, a change of uh, buying equities when they collapsed after there had been a peak. Uh, and there was buying in year T plus one. There was buying in the two year period, T plus one to T plus two, inclusive, and buying in the three year period from T plus one to T plus three. Um, the uh, strategy in the period which was the run up to that crisis period was that as uh, equities became more expensive, on average, there was a sell down in equities. So the average endowment over all six crisis periods, averaged across the 12 endowments, 
was a 3.6% reduction in equity exposure between year T minus three and T minus one. 2.4% between T minus two and T minus one, uh, 1.6 in year T minus one. And we leave out year T, that's when shares ran up to a peak and, and then declined. And we break that down into sub-periods lower down. Um, there was uh, uh, a consistent pattern for those sub-periods. So just to conclude what I've been covering, we've reported trends in endowments long-term investment strategy. The Ivy League universities, their endowments led the switch to equities and later they led the switch to alternatives. The big three, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, were first movers. The strategy throughout, which I played down a little bit here, but is described in the paper, was an increasing professionalization of uh, asset management. Um, and this coincided with the growth of the CFA Institute in the United States. And what do we find with the uh, financial evidence? Long horizon endowments invested counter cyclically. cyclically. That's, that's what they should be doing. And that contrasts with retail and other investors where there's a much larger literature that demonstrates that they invest pro-cyclically. Now for every pro-cyclical investor, there must be a counter-cyclical investor. Everyone who buys more of an asset as its price is going up has to buy it from someone. Um, we provide some evidence that there is a, a cohort that are counter-cyclical, but uh, that still leaves open the opportunity for others to identify others who are on the other side of the transactions from more emotional retail and other investors. Now, we now document uh, what I've been talking about. So for those of you who um, uh, would like to read more, this is the time to fish your uh, iPhone out of your pocket or whatever you are using uh, and take an image of this screen. There's three ways to get this uh, paper. It's not published yet. It will be coming out in December. One is that it's been uh, made an open access article. So if you uh, have access to financial analyst journal, which some of you will and some of you won't, uh, you can access it uh, from the pages of the journal. The second thing that you can do is look at the Social Science Research Network and you can download the working paper version of it uh, where I'm giving the ID number. So you type in www.ssrn.com slash ID equals 369-4139. And finally, all published papers end up with a DOI link. Um, often that will take you only to somewhere where you can pay to get the article. Um, but this one gets behind the paywall. So this DOI link uh, will get you the published version without having to subscribe to Financial Analysts Journal for this particular article. Um, and uh, this one you can't easily scribble down with a pen. Uh, that's why I suggested getting your iPhone out. So I'll just pause there for a moment um, and um, then I'll move forward. So if you want to take a photograph of that, you can. Um, and otherwise, we can find other ways of sharing that with you. So uh, I think at that point, I will stop the sharing uh, and uh, I'll pass things back to the home team. Uh, and uh, it's now the opportunity to. Uh, have uh, uh, Sui Ching open, uh, open things up for your questions. I think we're roughly on time. Are you on mute? You're, you're, on, you're on mute, Sui Che. You need to unmute. Uh, you're still muted. Yeah, I, I did unmute myself, no, but... Yeah, that's, the, the muting is very kind, and now we need you. <laughs> and I'm saying unmuted. Uh, thank you. Uh, I did unmute myself, but I was uh, counter secretly muted by uh, the person who is organizing uh, the webinar. All right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I understand. Uh, all right, that is an excellent... Uh, illuminating uh, lecture uh, and I enjoyed uh, 
your exposition uh, very much. Uh, what, what stood out for me was that this group of investors, especially the larger ones, uh, were really long-term uh, in their outlook and in their intent. Uh, they were early movers uh, into equities uh, 50, 80 years ago, and they were early movers into alternative assets. Yeah? Uh, and and they and they are anti-cyclical, um, and that is a big issue for many of uh, our members. Yeah, many of our members work either on the asset side or the liability side of large uh, investment institutions, uh, life assurance companies, in particular uh, with profit funds uh, and also in pension funds. Yeah, we, we leave the mutual funds and and the unit linked uh, aside first. Yeah. Uh, but for this large group of investors, uh, when they hear this presentation, there must be a so what are the lessons for us and how do we go about it? Uh, because the evidence show that uh, we, we, we suffer from uh, pro cyclicality. So, so what can be done for us to change that to, to the mindset which, um, which clearly uh, these investments institutions have. Uh, clearly, the governing regulations for, for pension funds uh, and for with profits funds are, are different. So I, I wonder whether you could uh, comment on that. Well, for every pro-cyclical investor, there has to be a, what you call an anti-cyclical. And for every anti-cyclical investor, there has to be a pro-cyclical investor. So the challenge I think that uh, people have is this that you'd like to be counter-cyclical, um, to buy cheap and sell expensive, but that is not the reality for many categories of investor. So uh, let's think about uh, a uh, with profits insurance company. Um, prior to the disturbances of uh, 2001, 2008, uh, quite a lot of insurance companies, including uh, the, the uh, dwindling number of mutuals, felt that uh, it would be beneficial for them to buy cheap and sell high. But when markets collapse in a big way, it gets to be much more dif difficult because markets can collapse, solvency margins get threatened, uh, and the insurance company that provides insurance that those people want, that uh, sells insurance that it knows will be profitable, will not be allowed by the regulator to sell insurance if, it buy, if their solvency margin looks threatened. So what they have to do is exactly, do, is precisely different from what they would like to do. Uh, what they would like to do is to keep on uh, selling at high prices, buying at low prices. Um, and often they'll do that when markets move modest amounts, but when they move by large amounts, they can't, and they, they, then they have to catch up. Some investors, they're not in that position. So some can take a long-term view. Um, and I'd say that the ones who take, can take a long-term view are the ones who don't know what they wish to do with their wealth. So sovereign funds, families, wealthy individuals can do that. So what about um, uh, pension funds? Well, I think a lot of it depends on the, the structure of pension funds. Um, my pension fund is uh, the university superannuation scheme. It's an extremely large pension plan in, in the United Kingdom. Um, and over the years, many people regarded it as a particularly safe plan because it's funded, but it would be very difficult to think of circumstances under which it would go bankrupt because this is part of the terms of service of university lecturers. And what would happen would be that universities have to put up contribution rates to catch up. But even USS, a huge fund, it turns out that uh, it has to do something about its underfunding and it cannot turn to the sponsoring employers to do that. So I, I, my take on this is that I think dynamic strategies, what I was referring to in terms of uh, uh, what uh, Bill Sharp has written about, what uh, Phil Dinfrick has written about, uh, and others. A dynamic strategy is very important. It's not that you need uh, 
to know that you are going to run with a 70-30 mix or a 50-50 mix. It's to know what will happen as you go through time if markets move against you. Uh, and you can't stop markets moving, but you can have a plan so that you bring in contingency planning to ensure that you won't be caught out by being unable to meet liabilities. So it's not entirely, I don't have an answer for those people who are troubled by this, but there are clearly some investors that are in a stronger position um, and those that are in a weaker position uh, amongst the different institutions that are represented on, on this call today. Thank you for that. Uh, th there are uh, a, a corollary, a corollary question to that. Yeah, uh, is from uh, uh, Andrew Burrell. Uh, he says that uh, endowments have showed wrong, uh, uh, strong returns, uh, notwithstanding an asset allocation that many life insurers will struggle to follow. Uh, due to regulatory capital constraints. Uh, given that life insurers have long dated liabilities, uh, it, it must follow that we should be able to be long term in our investments. So, is there, uh, do you have a comment? Uh, because Andrew basically asserted that our current uh, regulatory constraints, for example, Solvency 2, are not necessarily uh, in the interest of long-term savers. So we move into the slightly uh, more uh, uh, slightly outside uh, the domain of your, your lecture. Uh, but I would one, I wonder whether you would venture a view uh, uh, in respect of this question. Well, I think Andrew Burrell's uh, question is is uh, uh, extremely important. Um, what we've seen in in more recent decades um, is the dangers of having too little liquidity, uh, too much unmarketability. Uh, and so um, what happened with endowments in 2009, 2010, if you went round the campuses at Yale, I was at the time uh, teaching on a visiting basis at Yale for quite a long period, uh, Harvard was the same. You uh, walked around the, the uh, campus and you saw these large hoardings, and what they were were hiding building sites where uh, the beginnings had been started, uh, and they had to stop. And the endowments were under great pressure. Uh, there is a, was a very nice article, I think it was in Vanity Fair, uh, describing uh, what uh, Jane Mandillo, who at the time was the chief investment officer uh, of the Harvard endowment, um, had to deal with in terms of the, the uh, extreme illiquidity that they had, uh, the calls for cash and so forth. So I think what, what people might be tempted to do uh, is to go for what's sometimes called the illiquidity premium, and that is the alleged higher returns from unmarketable assets than from marketable assets. And you've got to be very careful about that. So some of the things that one can keep an eye on um, are ones where you may be paying away potential returns by being, by being illiquid at the wrong time. So I think uh, a, a careful eye on uh, uh, real estate and uh, what Americans would call alternative assets, that real estate is not an alternative asset, I think, here in Britain. Um, matching uh, liquidity to uh, the needs of, of uh, an organization, uh, as well as uh, risk exposure and so forth. So uh, Andrew can uh, shoot a, uh, a note across, but it's gonna be rather low on this list and you're probably gonna take me forward to uh, another question. So uh, yeah. let's... No, I, 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 yeah, I, I, yeah I, I, I don't think we could resolve that, uh, but clearly there are consequences uh, of, uh, of regulatory objectives, which may be unintended. Yeah? So that is a area uh, for debate. Yeah, uh, let us move to uh, another questioner, uh, Nick Spencer uh, from Guardian Investments. Uh, and he's, uh, he wanted to discuss about uh, uh, alpha over beta. Uh, alpha investments about the ability to identify better performing asset managers. Uh, 
and also being an early mover. Uh, and I, I think he wants your observation uh, whether this is a significant component of superior performance in addition uh, to their counter cyclicality. Well, I've already made the trite observation that for every uh, winner, there's a loser. Um, but that happens at the institutional level as well. So an amusing story, which not everyone on, on this uh, uh, conversation will be aware of, um, is the second uh, book which uh, David Swenson wrote. So he'd written this very influential book on how to manage long-term long pools of funds. Um, and then I think he felt compelled to explain what individuals who were probably the majority purchasers of his book should be doing. And so his advice, which is a whole book, uh, boils down to do the opposite of what I recommend. What I recommend for Yale is uh, illiquid assets, um, uh, alternative assets, and so forth. Uh, and sometimes those, of course, are quite expensive. Uh, if you're a member of the public, he was saying, which would also mean a, a modest pension plan or anything else like that, um, then uh, you should not be looking for esoteric managers who are expensive. You should be minimizing costs. Uh, you should not be buying illiquid assets because uh, you may need the liquidity. Uh, and his advice uh, is very much like the uh, advice which uh, uh, has been given by a number of other wealthy individuals, which is uh, cheap index funds are the way to go. I was for quite a number of years uh, chair of the Strategy Council for Norway, Norway Sovereign Wealth Fund. Um, and I often made the point that Norway had a strategy which could be mimicked by individuals because they believe very much in buying a diversified portfolio of assets and have a very, 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 very strong preference for marketable assets. Uh, and so the, for them, uh, the trick is extremely widespread diversification. Uh, and, and that can be mimicked, although it's an institutional investor that's doing it. Um, if we go back to the uh, US endowments, what they're doing is quite tough to replicate. Um, uh, the team at Yale, or at Harvard, receive guidance as to which of their alumni has started up a new hedge fund and they think it's a really smart team that's running it, or uh, which uh, uh, private equity team looks good, and the doors will open. But that means that others will be selecting bottom quartile, not top quartile managers and assets. Thank you. Uh, I have two interesting questions on comparatives UK and US from uh, Colin Wilson from the government's actuaries department. And okay. another question. Oh, um, yes. okay. from, hello, yeah. hello, Colin, because he, he was appointed as my minder when I was first an honorary fellow. And the other, what's the other question? And, and the other question is on Terry Hammond. But I, I, but I wanted to explore your observation uh, earlier uh, about individual investors. Uh, and, uh, and you mentioned, um, uh, and I was going to ask you, um, how, what can individual investors learn from this? Because individual investors, my sense is that we tend to be pro-cyclical, although your argument that there's always half of them are buyers and half of them are sellers must surely be a right one. That's my first part of the question. But, but how do you measure anti-cyclicality? Because you must have a basis of valuation that this is before the financial crisis. Are we before a financial crisis today? So I'm sort of exploring from individual investors' point of view, uh, how do we behave better in terms of investments to, to be anti-cyclical? And secondly, how do we judge that we are anti-cyclical, looking forward, not looking backwards? Well, that, of course, was my, my uh, spoof magazine article, so highlighting exactly that. When, you've, uh, when assets have gone up considerably, even at the peak, we don't know whether they'll continue to go up or to go down. But if they are expensive, then a contracyclical investor 
should be selling down that asset class a bit. On the way up, knowing that uh, the, the, the assets are cheap and they're going to go up, that's much more difficult. We can see that with hindsight. So my tables that look at performance before and after a crisis period, um, it's much easier to say now is the time when we should take some profits and move towards uh, a, a safer strategy. It's a bit tougher when assets are on the way up, you don't know whether they, they have reached a peak or not. You could be philosophical when assets are at a high, even if trimming your holding might mean you miss out on a further increase. So yeah, it's tough. And I think that those people who um, argue strongly that uh, you should time your investments are, uh, are pursuing a fairly risky strategy because it's difficult to know. And they're, they're inviting people to rely on, a, um, uh, on experts, but the experts don't know either. You don't know where the market's gonna be next year. I, 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 I will now go to Colin Wilson's uh, question, but I would also like to uh, ask you, suggest to you about some comments on the relevance of behavioral finance uh, in this regard. Uh, uh, Colin's uh, question was, uh, he, Colin is the deputy uh, governor actually, and he, he's interested in what are the differences uh, you see between U.S and UK endowment funds, university endowment funds. Uh, and, and I recall your paper mentioned about the lack of property in the US one, and the UK one is rich in property. Uh, yeah. And the second one is that uh, he was interested in if there are any cultural differences uh, visible in a comparison of pension funds uh, between the UK pension funds and the US pension funds. Uh, 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 so well, let, 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 me, let me start with um, the, the origins of these funds. So the origins of the uh, major endowments in the United Kingdom um, are gifts of land. Um, and uh, sometimes they went with other strange uh, things. So for example, um, there was one college that got given an, an endowment, a, a regular amount of wine, quite large quantities, that would uh, be there for the use of the masters and fellows of the college. Um, so it was land, the yield from the land, which technically meant uh, the, the financial yield from, um, uh, from, from the uh, farmland being utilized, uh, and even sometimes something more beside. Um, land in the US uh, was made available to universities for their campus, uh, but didn't typically find its way into the endowments. So the endowments in, in the uh, early part of the last century, um, they either held uh, government bonds or corporate bonds, um, or uh, they, they uh, held railroad stock, which is a sort of a bit like holding preferred stock. So uh, what at the time would have been deemed to be so safe securities. In the UK, there were also constraints. Um, the, the land could be accompanied uh, for British endowments with high-grade bonds, not corporate, uh, but uh, these would be government bonds. And the person to, to break the mould of that uh, was uh, John Maynard Keynes at King's College, who challenged what was deemed to be the guidelines as to what could be held, um, brought into equities, um, and had a rocky but uh, ultimately very successful record uh, as an investor on behalf of his college. I've, uh, together with David Chambers, written quite a lot on his work in investing in uh, financial securities, but we've also done work on uh, uh, his art portfolio, the art which he uh, purchased and gave to King's College, Cambridge, is worth about as much as the financial endowment. Uh. So I think I've only given half an answer because I've, I've uh, moved on to, a, I'm aware of the question that we had uh, earlier. I can tell you a bit more about uh, differences between the two. Uh, you, but let me, let me just stick with the, the crossover. John Maynard Keynes is cited um, 
by David Swenson as a major influence on him and the strategy that he followed for Yale. Um, and um, uh, he, uh, David Swenson uh, wrote to uh, myself and my two co-authors on this piece of research just yesterday, expressing pleasure again at uh, uh, the work that we've done and we have documented in other papers, the crossover between uh, his view uh, and the US. But nevertheless, it, the evolution was relatively independent. There was, there was awareness of things which were being written uh, in the US, but um, uh, they went their own direction and discovered uh, equities and risky assets relatively independently of each other. Thank you. Um, Hadri Hamid, uh, who I know is uh, uh, an actuarial consultant, a senior actuarial consultant, uh, he wants to thank you for your excellent lecture. Uh, but his very specific question uh, was that uh, he said that we have some idea on what we should not have done in the last 10 years. But could we have your thoughts on what we should not do in the next 10 years? Oh, that's a real sneaky question, isn't that? That's very, that's very, very nice. Um, well, let me start out by drawing the distinction between what endowments should be, do and what pensions should do. So for a conventional pension fund, um, we talk about asset liability matching. And the way that that is implemented is we try to quantify the liabilities that the fund has. And we then try to ensure that the investments are in an appropriate set of assets to meet those liabilities. When it comes to endowments, we don't talk about uh, liability asset matching, but liability asset matching is what we do. So rather than asset liability matching, where we buy assets to meet the pension fund's liabilities, what the endowment does is it works out what the spending rule can be that ensures that the spending on liabilities is commensurate with the wealth of the college. And so, uh, there will be a view as to how many students can be supported, when one should anticipate repairing the, the roof of the chapel uh, or whatever it happens to be. Uh, and so the language that's used there is um, a spending rule and many uh, endowments use the Yale spending rule, which smooths spending over time. Um, what should uh, um, individuals do? I think the uh, individuals who are saving for their retirements should be um, uh, matching their spending to their assets uh, and not purely working out what the assets are that will enable them to reach their spending goals. Uh, individuals are just a slightly easier case than uh, working out what pension strategy should look like. Uh, but it, this matching process is two-way and uh, there are obviously some constraints from a regulatory point of view, but uh, it's a two-way process. And um, nowadays, uh, that is, it is challenging because looking forward with very low interest rates and with a view that uh, other assets will give returns that build on what you get this free, uh, all expected returns have got lower and lower and lower uh, and uh, each quarter, each year, they tended to get lower by an amount that exceeds what we thought would be plausible. I don't think anybody anticipated that low risk investment would have a negative real expected return. Uh, it just kind of happened. That is a, a very interesting way uh, to engage the problem because you have actually reversed the paradigm instead of trying to match our assets to our liability. We should match our liabilities to our assets by designing products which match the kind of assets. Uh, that's how I heard you, how I heard you. But I think that in the last, I think that is what we have been sort of doing uh, by transferring risks uh, to the individuals, yeah? whether it's pension funds from defined benefits to, to, uh, to uh, uh, to define contributions and investments uh, in profits to, to unit linked. Uh, 
uh, because we were trying to arrange the liabilities uh, to match the assets we have. But obviously, this is not uh, going to be uh, easily resolved. And I think we have a, 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 a set of a, a platform to think about this called Great Risk Transfer, uh, which is championed by my predecessor, John, John Taylor. Yes. But I think this is a good bridge for us to go to the next question uh, by Louis Pryor, who is actually uh, another member of the presidential team, and then Martin White. Yeah? Uh, Luis, Luis actually raised a more fundamental question about risk. Uh, she said that uh, you talk about risk. Uh, how, how, what do you mean by risky assets? Uh, and how do you measure it? Risky in terms of volatility, in terms of how we measure them today. Uh, uh, if it is the case, how, how does high volatility correlate with high long-term view of risk? So she, she wants you to explore that. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, let's go back to thinking about uh, the way we quantified risk originally. And so once risk was something which uh, was deemed to matter, uh, people started focusing on risk in absolute terms. If they're a little bit cleverer, it might have been uh, a measure of downside risk rather than a symmetric measure of risk. But I think what's become clear now is that the volatility of assets doesn't help you a great deal. Um, volatility of assets relative to liabilities helps you a bit, but actually risk differs a great deal between one beneficiary group and another. Um, and uh, that's, uh, that, that is kind of um, uh, unfortunate because different groups may have different needs and often the products that are being made available to them uh, are on a pooled basis, so you need to uh, imagine that everybody shares the same tastes. Where, um, the, 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 the sort of halfway house is to look at uh, the risk of surpluses or deficits, but it's often not thought through fearfully well. Uh, one pension fund that I had uh, involvement with uh, found itself severely underfunded um, really because of some poor wording and the promises that were made to, uh, to some employees. But the solution was to get rid of the underfunding over a period. And that period was very long, 10 years, uh, with no assumption about being able to earn money over the intervening period. Um, but also, if you didn't earn any money, uh, you know, at the end of eight years, the risk might be greater or might be less. So closing the gap um, between uh, promises, either contractual promises or implicit promises, uh, and the assets that you've got, um, that's, uh, that's an important part of strategy, and uh, those risks uh, are very real to people. And the reality, as I say, is that people have different needs, and uh, some people will uh, need their pension savings or other savings uh, to clothe and feed themselves. Others will have assets that they don't expect ever to spend, that, the, that, that their objective may be more of a legacy objective than a spending need. And uh, um, if we're sticking with uh, pension type arrangements, one needs to take account of that. And uh, uh, this involves having more of a human touch providing some counselling. Uh, in the US, it is commonplace for uh, there to be some form of financial advice for people who, in the main, run their own pensions through, uh, through, a, 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 uh, through a set of funds that they're eligible to buy. That's newer in other countries. But uh, um, I think giving independent financial advice of a modest nature, which is uh, what people get with their, uh, with their corporate pension plans in the US, there's scope for more of that, although there have been moves forward in non-US countries. Thank you. You know, you've got lots of very impressive, very senior people asking questions. I think it's time for you to search for one who's about to, 22 years old and has been overlooked as you as you notice these very eminent names there 
Is that, but I don't know whether you can tell from this. Uh, I, I, I think it's uh, uh, your, your name attracted all the senior members of the profession uh, who was here to, uh, here to uh, all the old geezers like myself. Okay. <laughs> But I uh, okay. Uh, I, we could. But I thought it was a bit of quite a good bridge, yeah, uh, to 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 all the questions, yeah. Uh, we, we have a question on, which actually takes us slightly out of your paper, but I think it marries to what you just said about thinking through what is going on here. And, and there's a question from Martin White, who, who I believe is a, quite a shareholders uh, uh, advocate, yeah, and he he's asking a more philosophical question. Uh, he said that we are talking about a zero-sum game where every winner, there is a loser. The underlying wealth creation process is taking place in the underlying companies. Can investors do anything to improve this process? Um, uh, and, and also the, the question of crowding out of public equities by private markets, is it a concern? Uh, in 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 the future, uh, uh, you, you may want to comment on that, uh, uh, Elroy. I'm going, to get, I'm going to ask you to give me a prompt on that second question. Let me stick with uh, Martin White's question first of all. Um, uh, what we mean by a zero sum game is that if there's a gain to one person, there's a loss to another. But that does not mean necessarily lost money. It's an opportunity cost. So um, uh, uh, it. it, it what, what we mean is that if somebody moves ahead in financial markets by buying uh, uh, one asset, there has to be a seller. It's on the other side of the transaction. I think what Martin White may be referring to, but he may, may or may not through the chat come back with a, a clarification, is what we can do to influence uh, underlying corporates. This is what, uh, what asset management companies who engage with companies try to do. They try to have an influence on the governance of the company. Um, they try to have an influence on the social and environmental behavior of the company. So uh, that's a whole different stream of, of issues. It's one that interests me greatly. Um, in the share market, it will still be the case that for each person who, for example, sells a share too cheaply, there's somebody else's is um, uh, on the other side of the deal. But in terms of influencing investee companies, this is a really big issue. Uh, there are uh, huge volumes of assets which uh, uh, are managed by firms or are owned by asset owners who have signed up to the PRI, the Principles for Responsible Investment, whose aggregate assets are just enormous. And um, uh, Although the focus is on ESG, environmental and social, it's also on the G governance issues. And there are other groups um, who are more strongly focused on governance questions. So I think there is the, the issue of engagement. Engagement from one investor, by which I don't simply mean um, uh, any one person, I mean any one institution, is difficult. Only a few investors have the trillions and trillions of dollars to influence uh, the companies that they own to behave or, or run their businesses in a different way. Um, and so there's a lot of scope to collaborate with others. And that's an area in which I've been uh, working with uh, other colleagues. Uh, coordinating the engagement with companies is uh, uh, the right way to go because sometimes you just need enough voice enough votes to persuade companies to behave differently. Uh, that's probably given as much attention to Martin as he was expecting. What was your part two question again? The, the part two question was on the uh, crowding out of, uh, uh, by, by alternative assets uh, or private equity. Uh, uh, so there were, the uh, mm. public, public markets are sh shrinking relative to private markets. Uh, is that a concern, you know, given, uh, the, given that we always 
thought that the public markets are transparent and it is uh, uh, efficient and, and so forth. Yeah. But of course, if we go back a long way, only a very small minority of companies were traded and therefore most equity was private equity. So if we go back to the 1800s, the early 1900s, um, uh, most, yeah, most wealth that was managed was managed uh, not by people for whom uh, there were delegated responsibilities through the stock market. The stock market became more important, um, but uh, private equity has had a resurgence. Um, the people who did not go through the stock market but owned assets directly, the asset owners of uh, 100 years ago, um, were probably less concerned about uh, liquidity. These were very wealthy people. Um, and what we're talking about now is beneficiaries for whom um, their savings are tied up in listed companies. The uh, volume of uh, assets that are managed by private equity have gone up. Uh, and uh, there are uh, a number of ways in which private equity continues to prosper. Um, the British government recently made it clear that it, for example, um, did not want um, uh, companies that were deemed to be unsatisfactory, unsavory, to gain listings on the London Stock Exchange. Well, that means that since the companies still will continue with their business, uh, an accidental byproduct of this is that the British government is encouraging uh, companies to remain private. That's the same as the companies who choose to be private because they think that there is uh, less intrusion by way of regulation, statutory requirements and so forth. So there is an issue here and uh, in a number of countries people are concerned about increasing concentration, increasing proportions of the market value of assets that are in the hands of a small number of companies. Thank you. I, I would um... Ask another question from the audience, uh, put another question from the audience before we draw the webinar to a close. Uh, and, and this time, uh, it is from, a, uh, it's an anonymous and probably from a less experienced actuary. Yeah? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and, and here, I think you, you want to know whether there is really a change in, in mood uh, towards ESG investments. Uh, uh, you, you, you touched on it earlier on, but a real change uh, by, by the top tier universities given recent conversations and market uh, focus on ESG? I think it's been a, a truly astonishing change. Um, in um, well, about five or six years ago, we published a paper that had been around for a while, uh, a paper called Active Ownership, which was in probably the first ESG paper in the top three finance journal. <coughs> and the, the story there was to do with the uh, impact and the financial value also of engaging with investee companies. Um, and in brief, um, it looked as though engagement with investee companies was on average not, not harmful. Uh, and in cases where there was success, it was actually quite profitable. Um, but since then, there's been a huge outflow of research on uh, active ownership and uh, engagements with investee companies. And so that's one stream. At the same time, as somebody whose position is at Cambridge, got to be aware of the enormous pressures to divest from uh, companies that are ranked low on their ESG credentials. Um, I, um, uh, I'm uh, isolating somewhat. I'm not, uh, I, I'm, I'm not in quarantine, I'm isolating at home. I'm not in Cambridge, but uh, uh, my colleagues who are in Cambridge have found that they can't even get to work if they're allowed in. Uh, there's about one in 10 of the people who would work in the business school in Cambridge that are allowed in, nine out of 10 are not allowed in because of the safety issues, but um, uh, they can't get in because of Extinction Rebellion. And uh, uh, they, the, the roads are blocked and there are demonstrators uh, and uh, very, uh, very strong feelings. Um, the university has uh, made a move towards um, 
and guaranteeing that they will uh, move away from uh, fossil fuel companies and a number of others and move the university faster than others towards being a net zero university in terms of fossil fuel usage. But a lot of this comes about through uh, pressure to divest. And that five years ago looked like a rather fringe sort of view. But a company that you don't like, well, you don't have to have the embarrassment of, uh, of owning it, sell it and somebody else will buy it. Um, but it won't really make much difference in the end. And the world doesn't see it that way any longer. The chief executives don't want to be cited in the newspapers as being the chief executive of a company that is uh, ruining the environment or does other things which are unpleasant. So um, uh, both uh, divestment and engagement are both part of the tools of, uh, uh, of managing a portfolio and uh, ESG issues will remain at the forefront for quite a while. Thank you. Uh, I think the answer must be very heartening to, uh, to our members. Yeah. Uh, so, so uh, Professor Alroy, I'd like to uh, uh, draw tonight's event to a close and to, to, to really thank you uh, for speaking to us. Uh, and of course, to thank all the people who attended. Uh, we do organize such events and conferences throughout the year, which give all of us an opportunity uh, to support uh, the IFOA uh, in our work as a learned society. Yeah. Uh, we hope that you will join us in, in our 2021 winter lecture. Uh, our guest speaker in February next year will be economist Vicky Price. So keep your eyes peeled for any updates via our websites at uh, www.actuaries.org.uk. Uh, there will be a feedback form, a survey form, which will be sent to you. And I hope that you will be able to uh, complete that and send it back to us. Uh, so this uh, concludes uh, this evening's event. So thank you all. Uh, uh, and, and thank you, uh, uh, Professor Dimson again uh, for such an engaging uh, lecture and a Q&A session. Well, Good the, the thank you comes from me as well. Uh, you've been a very engaging audience and uh, uh, the number of questions and really good questions that uh, you shared with me and have appeared on the chat uh, greatly exceeds my already high expectations. So what a wonderful community to uh, be talking with. Uh, thank you for this evening. Thank you. So with that